Good morning and welcome to Wycliffe Presbyterian Church. Today you will find a flyer in your bulletin that is in regards to forming a lunch bunch. Please read the flyer and if you're interested in joining the lunch bunch, please complete the bottom portion of the flyer and return it to Thelma. The full Bible study began today, the travels and ministry of Peter, selections from the book of Acts, letter of Peter. All are welcome and if you missed the Bible study, you can view it on YouTube or on website at www.wicklipresbyterian.org. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Small kindnesses. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by. Or how strangers still say bless you when somebody sneezes. Or when you have trouble at the grocery store and someone helps you at your, helps you pack your bags or helps you pick up something that's fallen. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and say thank you to the person handing it. To smile at them, for them to smile back. For the waitress to call us honey when she sets down a bowl of hot soup. And for the driver in a red pickup truck to let us pass back. We have so little of each other now. So far from tribe and fire. Only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy? These fleeting temples we make together when we say, Here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. Remember, be the best of humanity. We are all just walking each other home. Love life. Be kind. Let us be a worship together.
welcome to worship at Wycliffe Presbyterian Church. Before we go any farther, we have a special guest today. This is Gabriel. And you are a student where? At Oberlin Conservatory. Uh, Oberlin Conservatory. Gee, I wonder how you and Elena met up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you're here today, and that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. We have a wonderful day today. There's a lot going on. The sun is out. It's beautiful. Let's enjoy it. As Annie says, live life. For the next hour, let us concentrate on what we are being told by, by God, what we are being told through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, what we are telling each other. Sing as if you're really singing to God. Pray as if we're really praying to God. And more importantly, talk to each other as we are truly part of the body of Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to be at this place at this time. Help us to listen to the word that you have provided. We hope that the words we sing and the words we say and the music we play is pleasing to you. And we hope that during the quiet times you will speak to us and lead us not only in this hour, but all the hours to come. Amen. Now let us join together in the call to worship. Abundance is everywhere. God's creation overflowing with wonder. A delicate spider web sparkling with morning dew. Go fresh air on a following afternoon. A crisp apple and the smell of pumpkin pie. A warm spider and a tender embrace. God's love and grace. Lavish, abundant, and ever present. A sense of presence in the quiet moments of prayer. A deep joy in the midst of a song. God's blessing. Generous and abundant. Calling us to sing. We're going to sing hymn 147, How Great Thou Art.
again. He talked about a lot of little things. You know, take my seat. Giving help to someone. You know, a lot of us, you know, look at what Christianity seems to require of us and say, I'm not worthy. But it's the little things, like Annie was talking about, that is what matters. Not only today, but all the days. And that is what our prayer of confession is all about. So let us share the prayer of confession together. Merciful God, forgive us when we feel we have little to give. Help us to remember the widow's gift and all the little gifts of love given to us that made a difference in our lives. May we in turn give to others. Amen. My friends, God turns us around, opens our eyes, renews our faith, and forgives our sins. We are truly blessed, and the people of God, wherever they are, say together, Thanks Thank be to God. God. And now it is time for us to pass the peace. Again, we got to stand in place and, and wave and yell if you want. But uh, uh, we're, we're, although, the, uh, as I understand it, the conditions for COVID are starting to improve some, hopefully we'll get to the point where we're able to uh, actually uh, stand in the hall and, and say something. And uh, don't forget to say hello to Gabriel after, after the service if you'd like. If you're an old guy like me, you remember the 1970 gas lines. Remember those? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, the, what's funny is we were going to school to get in Illinois. They didn't have any. But unfortunately, I lived in Chicago. So back in the early 70s, remember when we got cut off by OPEC? We used to have to get in line at like 4 o'clock in the morning for a gas station that opened up hopefully at 6.30. So we have our place in line, be able to get gas. Because we remember what they used to do. They were allocated so many gallons of gas for a day, and once that was gone, that was it. If you were in line, too bad. If also, you couldn't, in, the, in Illinois, you couldn't pump your own gas. So there was a guy standing there doing it, and he was the sloppiest guy you ever saw in your life. If you recall, Remember everybody's cars driving around with gas trails underneath the gas tank because the guy just yanked it out while it was still going. Oh, it was a miserable time. Well, anyway, New York City had it even worse. And there was a story about a gas, a gas line in Brooklyn that went around a corner, okay? Because, you know, in Brooklyn there isn't a whole lot of room, so that, you know, you don't, you've got to be, you know, parked along the street and all that. Well, apparently, if you recall what would happen is you'd get up there and the guy would, you know, you couldn't, there was no credit cards or anything. So basically they'd give you like five dollars worth of gas and you gave him five bucks and then you left. And it was slowing things down because the guy had to take the money. You know, remember how they used to be? They used to take the money and all go back to the, to the, to the gas station and come back with your change and all that. Well, all of a sudden, these people are waiting in line, and a guy dressed in the uh, uh, uniform, uh, or what looked like the uniform of the gas station owner, or Shell or whoever it was, and he's got one of those little change things, and he's got the little uh, uh, thing that Helen wears when she's selling tickets for the uh, baskets, the little, the little bag there. And what he's doing is he's got a roll of raffle tickets. And he says to speed things up, here's what we're going to do. I'll take the money from you right now, I'll give you a raffle ticket for every dollar you give me. Then when you go to the guy, just hand him the raffle tickets, it'll be so much faster. We figured this out. And hey, wait a minute, this is a pretty good idea. So he's going around, you know, he's going around the corner. So he's going all the way up and down this, this, these people and he's, he's getting this money from them and he's giving them tickets. And, then they arrive at the gas station finally, get in line, get their gas, hand the tickets to the guy, and he says, what the heck is this? What do you mean, what the heck is this? Wasn't so that your guy running around? No, we don't even know who he was. By this time, he's halfway to New Jersey with, every, with other people's money. Now, why would you give money to 
a guy like that. He was dressed in what looked like, because if you remember back in those days, uh, the gas station people all wore you know, shirts and everything that identified the, the gas company they worked for, gasoline company they worked for. And you remember they used to have the bottle in the one pocket to glass the windows with and all that kind of thing. So he looked right. He addressed the problem that everybody was frustrated with. It's like he knew the lingo. So you trusted him. And he made off with your money. Sometimes we trust people to do things for us. And sometimes they kind of leave town with our money. But thank goodness we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can trust all of the time. After all, he gave himself for all of us. If that isn't the most trustworthy thing you can think of that any person could do, then I'd like to know what the other thing is. Praise be to God. Amen.
Psalm 79, verses 1 through 9, and it can be found on page 168. It's a psalm of Asaph. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have left the dead bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the sky, the flesh of your own people for animals of the wild. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there are no one to bury the dead. We are objects of contempt to our neighbours, of scorn and derision to those around us. How long, Lord? Will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of past generations. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us. God our Saviour, for the glory of your name, deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. The New Testament lesson is Luke 16 verses 1 to 13. It can be found on page 1094 in the uh, red Bibles that are in the uh, pew in front of you. In this particular case, Jesus is talking about a so-called trusted servant who got caught with his hands in the cookie jar. And what is going to happen to this man and the message for the rest of us that comes from it. Luke 16, verses 1 to 13. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800, uh, you know, 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will, you trust you, who will trust you with the true riches? And if you have not been trusty with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. May God bless the reading of his word on this special Sabbath day. You know, sometimes people we know and respect do not turn out what we think they're going to be. Consider some of these politicians that I actually had the chance to meet. When I was in the fifth grade, think about this, fifth grade, 
My class traveled by train from Chicago to the state capital in, in, in Springfield. Look at this, fifth grade, we're traveling on a train, halfway down the state. As I recall, my mother was one of the chaperones, and uh, she, she had a tough day. Anyway, uh, we were going to go there to visit the state capital, and then we were going to go to the restored town of New Salem, where Abraham Lincoln lived. That was kind of cool. It's still there, by the way. When we went to the capital, our class got a lucky break. We crossed paths with Governor Otto Kerner. The governor! He's talking to my fifth grade class. We got to shake his hand, and he spoke to us for quite a while. You know, actually trying to talk to us as if, you know, it, uh, you know, basically down like this so he could talk eye to eye with us. He even told us that his son got a D on his report card. You know what he said that stood for? Dandy. Uh, anyway, each of us had been given a book at the Capitol, and he signed his name to every single one of the books. As I recall, this is the first time I ever actually got to meet something, someone you would call a celebrity. Okay? Now, Governor Kerner, you, know, you have to understand, this is Illinois, this is the 60s. Governor Kerner was called Mr. Clean. He had married the daughter of former mayor of Chicago, Anton Cermak. Anybody remember who Anton Cermak was? Why there's a town named after him and a street named after him? Well, apparently it, there was a rally in Miami that he was at along with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was running for president. And someone, they claim, tried to shoot the president. And depending on which story you believe, Anton Cermak either took the bullet for him or he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Either way, uh, government, you know, either way, he was revered from that point forward. So, you know, this is who Governor Kerner was married to, his daughter. In 1968, Governor Kerner stepped down to address his wife's health. Then President Lyndon Johnson appointed him to a federal appeals judge post in Chicago. You know, that was that was a big deal back then. Federal judges, you know, they, they, even to this day. Federal judges are very special people, and you have to be appointed. So everything is going along the way I expected with this guy until December 16, 1971. I was a freshman in college then. The Chicago Tribune reported that then U.S. Attorney James Thompson, he say then U.S. Attorney, why would he say that? Because James Thompson eventually became the governor. And he was the next Mr. Clean. But anyway, James Thompson had uh, put together a task force and uncovered a racetrack scandal. See, back to the, for the younger people, back in those days, racetracks were very popular. And people bet a lot of money at those things. Now what they do is convert them into casinos. <laughs> but back then, race track, race, horse racing was a very <clears throat> big thing. If you recall in the Plain Dealer, there was even there was probably even the odds in all the races. Well, I forget who the guy, you know, Bob the Real Bird, I guess, used to rate the horses and everything. So this was a big deal. Former Governor Kerner was accused of secretly buying stock back in 1966 in Arlington Park and Washington Park, the two largest racetracks in Chicago. And uh, he got those, that stock at a deep discount in exchange for certain political favors. Judge Kerner was found guilty in February of 1973 of bribery, conspiracy, and income tax evasion. This was Mr. Clean, don't forget. Forever Governor Kerner became the first sitting U.S. appellate judge to be convicted in the nation's history. We had no idea that was coming. Then in 1970, I was elected by the Chicago Area Council of the Boy Scouts to represent the city in the annual report to the governor. I was appointed director of the Department of Business and Economic Development for the day, and they had a fancy luncheon for all of us. After that, I had the privilege of shaking hands to Secretary of State Paul Powell, who gave me my state commission, which I still have. It really looks impressive, okay? 
Uh, but it also says in front of it, you know, Eagle Scout Director, not Director. They added that, so make sure that you wouldn't get confused. So anyway, uh, he, I shook hands with him. I got a picture of it, and I got to meet, uh, you know, Paul Powell. And Paul Powell at that time had a reputation for taking care of his constituents and doing the right things. Maybe he did a few shady things in the, here and there, but in Illinois there's a saying, he may be a crook, but as long as he's my crook, I don't care. However, Secretary Powell died suddenly on a trip to Minnesota. The secretary did what all the uh, major politicians did in those days. They had, they had lived at home, wherever home was, but they all lived at hotels or apartments in Springfield. And he was at the St. Nicholas Hotel. And they made an inventory of his possessions there. And when they did, a large amount of cash was discovered. According to the Chicago Tribune's account, the money found in the apartment was in a shoe box, two leather briefcases, three steel strong boxes, and they were hidden behind old whiskey cases and mixed among the old clothing in the closet so no one would find them. The cash added up to three quarters of a million dollars. In cash. Think of how much space three quarters of a million dollars takes up. There was another cash of $50,000 that was found in his office. Now you have to understand, when I got my license plates and I sent in for my license plates, the check was written to Secretary of State Paul Powell. That's who he wrote it to. So maybe that had something to do with all that money that was sitting around. Now I said when his assets were deposited in banks and started drawing interest, his estate had a cash value two years later of more, of more than three million plus 61,290 shares in several Illinois racetracks. Not bad for a guy whose annual salary never topped $30,000. <laughs> this was the same man who said, there is only one thing worse than a defeated politician, and that's a defeated and broke one. Now these two men were people that my family and I trusted and respected, yet each of them used their position and influence to pad their incomes well beyond what, their, you know, like what they were allowed to have or should have had. In each case, there was no evidence of wrongdoing until they had reasons to dig deeper. Clearly, these public officials were given positions of stewardship of the public trust, our trust. In the end, each one was not the steward we expected. People wonder how these improprieties could have gone on for so long. $750,000 missing should have shown up someplace. I mean, I'm not that good of a books auditor, but I'd have found it. There was an old saying in my neighborhood, as I said before, Maybe these people are, might deep down be crooks, but as long as they continue to serve me as crooks, I don't care. Now that's a message about stewardship. Use, Jesus used the same message today. In Jesus' day, there were many absentee landlords, okay, that would just own property and there might be all kinds of things going on. There might be, uh, uh, you know, wine trees where there's a winery, and there might be, uh, as they say, wheat fields, and there, and each person, there's each landlord would have a manager who would bring in people to manage all of these pieces of land. Now, the landlord was not paid in cash; he was paid in kind. So that explains why the manager asked, well, "What?" Does you, what do you owe? And it was so many barrels of oil and so many bushels of wheat and so on and so forth. The steward was responsible for collecting the goods and saving them for the landlord. In other words, whatever they owed, he had to set it aside so that when the landlord came back, it was theirs. Now, the steward was caught either embezzling when he made his collections or he had just not bothered to collect anything at all. When he was caught, the steward chose to conspire with the tenants to give himself an out when he was relieved of his duties. 
He figured, well, if I'm nice to all of them, maybe one of them will get me a job. As Jesus suggests, the steward did not have the stomach to work in a menial job, and he hoped one of the tenants would hire him for a similar position. However, Jesus goes on to say that the landlord that had the same attitude that many of my neighborhood did, the landlord knew the steward was a crook, but admired the fact that he was a shrewd crook. The message Jesus was giving about was about the stewardship of earthly things. There are actually four parts. First of all, Jesus tells us that children in this world are wiser than the children of light. This is a fancy way of saying it takes a lot of intelligence and hard work to embezzle and swindle in this day and age. Think of all these people that hack your accounts. These people are not stupid people. They work hard at this. If that time and energy was used to promote the kingdom of God except, uh, rather than trying to attain more money and higher com comfort, think of how much better the world would be. William Barclay says that people often spend 20 times the amount of time, money, and effort on pleasure, hobbies, and sports, or otherwise on themselves, than they do to support and work for their church. Christianity becomes more real when people use some of their time, talent, and treasury to support the church so that it can minister the way God wants it to minister. After all, the good news is not told unless who tells it? us. The great things in Christ's service don't happen unless who does it? Us. Second, Jesus asks us to recognize what our time, talent, and treasury might be used for. Some believe that what is yours is mine and what is mine is mine. The accumulation of wealth has become an obsession for some people, and that's how they define themselves, don't they? It was certainly for the two people I spoke of. However, so think of some time that somebody shared their wealth on your behalf or your church's behalf. College scholarships are given by somebody They're not required to. Social security is paid by people who are working and used by people who have been retired. The church is standing here because many people through the years have supported it in any number of ways, just like you are doing. The community benefits through ministries such as the thrift store, which relies on donations from other people to exist. The rabbis had a saying, the rich help the poor in this world, but the poor help the rich in the world to come. True wealth does not consist of what people keep, but may actually consist of what people give away. Then again, there's also sincerity. Some people give because they feel they have to. Does anybody know which organization during the Depression in Chicago fed more people than anybody else? Guess? Salvation Army is a good guess. Any others? The Steel Workers. The Steel Workers. Actually, it was Al Capone. <laughs> Al Capone had the largest soup kitchen in Chicago and fed more people than anybody else. And why do you think he did that? Goodwill. Uh, what's that? Goodwill. Goodwill. He wanted, to get, he wanted a good name for the Lord, see? Closer to home, I work with the Miles Park Church. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. It's on 76th and Broadway, I think is where it was. The real name of the church was the John M. Davison Bible Society of Cleveland. And I said, where did that come from? He said, back, uh, the uh, pastor was Bill Keene at the time. He said, back in the Depression, this guy walked in with a lot of money and says, I'll support your church but during these hard times. The only thing I want is I want you to rename the, the building for me. Now they knew this guy was a little shady. Actually, he was a lot shady. But he was trying to make points with the Lord. So they compromised. 
They changed the official name of the church from the books to be the John M. Davis Society, but they left Miles Park Presbyterian on the building. The motives here are to make points with God on their own behalf instead of using God's wealth to build God's kingdom for the benefit of all and not asking anything in return. God's grace is the gift that expects nothing in return. Sharing our wealth should have the same expectation. Third, Jesus tells us that fulfilling a small task is the best indicator of the ability to handle a larger one. We know this is true for earthly things. If you owned a business, would you trust the one employee that you have that comes to work late and falls asleep every day at their desk to run it? Some of you might. Some of you might say, well, it's, it's, it's my sister-in-law. <laughs> but in reality, or brother-in-law, whatever, in reality, most of you wouldn't. What is important today is that Jesus extends this notion to eternity. It's as if Jesus says to us, upon earth you are in charge of the things that are not really yours. You cannot take them with you. They are only lent to you. You are a steward over them. They cannot, in the nature of things, be permanently yours. On the other hand, in heaven you will get what is really and internally yours. What you get in heaven depends on how you use things on earth. What will be given to you as your very own will depend on how you use things of which you are only a steward. Finally, Jesus gives as one of the lines that everybody remembers. No one can serve two masters. We need to look at the words Jesus uses. To begin with, he uses the word slave. There were many slaves in Jesus' time. Many. A slave is owned by a second word, a master. The slave must dedicate himself to the master 24-7. Failure to do so would lead to punishment. The people that Jesus ministered to understood that. A slave having two masters would be impossible. One would say, go to the river and get me some water. The other would say, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do something else. And the first one would say, either do what I tell you or I'm going to beat you up. The second one would say, do what I tell you or I'm going to beat you up. That's what he's trying to say here. He's saying, it's easy to see why a slave would learn to love one and hate the other in that case. What Jesus is asking us is, who, our master, who is our master right now? Who is your master? Is it the acquisition of wealth and where that leads, or the leadership of Jesus Christ? <coughs> Many people have had full or part-time jobs, as I did, and some of you do, and, and, and still have. I didn't take on a second job for various reasons. Jesus isn't talking about that. What he is asking, what motivates you when you work? You know, there's, you know, you hear the phrase, there's a difference between living to work and working to live. That's what he's saying here. Jesus wants uh, people to measure themselves based on what time, talent, and treasure they accomplish in this world and in our service rather than the pile of money that you've got in the bank or wherever you have it invested. It must take be a full-time commitment, Jesus says. In other words, there's nothing wrong with working for a large salary as long as it is not the sole reason for acquiring wealth and our only ambition in life. If we have Jesus as our master and go where he leads, then wealth cannot be our master. Remember, Jesus had some rich friends. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich guy, yet he was very much a follower of Jesus and did the things that Jesus asked him. Let's conclude with this illustration. The Reverend Dick Trickle of the City Mission told a story about a man who came into his office one day and wanted to put up the money to start a homeless shelter. The man said he would put up the money as long as City Mission would run it, and he got his name on the building. Reverend Trickle told the man that Cleveland already had enough of those kinds of shelters. 
What they really needed was more committed people to work in the homeless shelters that they already had. Reverend Trickle was going to pick up the phone and arrange for this guy to do that. The man became visibly upset, left, and never, Reverend Trickle never saw him again. On the other hand, Jimmy Carter, we all remember Jimmy Carter, has an estimated net worth of $7 million, which for a president, you know, that's retired, is low. Bill Clinton had a net worth of $55 million, and George H.W. Bush had $23 now, it can be argued that President Carter, and if there's another one I'd like to hear who it was, was almost as well, maybe better known, for the work he did after he was president than the work he did while he was president. He is known for the Habitat for Humanity bills that he and his wife, Rosalind, sponsored. They began those bills in 1986, just five years after he left office. Unlike the man in Reverend Trickle's office, the former president not only sponsored the bills, he worked on build a house of his own. He had a hammer and he was up on a ladder pounding nails. How do we know? A man in our presbytery, Johnny Ray, was his personal translator when they went to uh, uh, Romania and did a build. And he watched that president work as hard as anybody else in the office. While the former president had a sizable fortune that comes to most presidents, President Carter has done all that first-hand work and everybody notices it. To this day, he lives in a modest house and he actually goes over and sees friends and neighbors and talks to them. President Carter has shown us how to serve God by building houses for God's people in need while at the same time being what we might say is wealthy. The lesson today for us is simple. We can simply give a little money and let someone else do God's work on our behalf, but we can use our time, talent, and treasury in God's service. Service Jesus as our master means that God entrusts us with what really belongs to him. Remember, God doesn't need the money. But there's a lot of God's people that do. It is what we do as stewards, though, that matters. Most of us are not pleased when we find out about somebody who has embezzled money from someone else. How upset would you be if you found out about someone embezzling from God? Only then, when we meet Jesus, will we discover the value of the work we actually have done in this life. And that's each of us. Only then we will learn if Jesus considered us a trusted servant. If the answer is yes, Jesus will meet us and tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. Praise be to God. Amen.
think today's message pretty much talks about time, talents, and treasure. So I don't need to go over it again. The important thing is that's what makes this ministry go today, tomorrow, and in all the days to come. Let us pray. Lord God, may we be good stewards of what you have given us, for we know that everything we have is a gift from you. Help us to manage it for your service so that the community that we are located in benefits, so that your kingdom beyond this building benefits, and above all, the members here benefit. We ask that you guide us and help us to manage the wealth that you have given to us in the most efficient and effective way that we can, so that not only when we take care of our needs, but also realize that the needs of your kingdom are just as important. We ask these things in your name. Amen. And you have a couple of friends that we've been talking about, wondering how they're doing. Oh, doing the same, you know, hanging in there. Um, I also, like I say, have concerns about where I work. Um, there's a lot of discord and unhappiness in the job right now. And I think we just need to continue to pray for where I work and other places where people just quit and come back and argue and fight. Okay, are there any other concerns? Uh, yes. You have a good trip. Thanks. Uh, visiting family? Or? Yeah, I have two sons and three grandmothers. So, are there any others today? If not, let us bow our heads for prayer. Lord God, creator and sustainer of all things large and small. We thank you for your love and caring that you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, who instructed us about the difference between earthly wealth and true riches, the true riches to come. 
Help us to remember that everything we have comes from you and teach us to manage it for your service. Lord God, we continue to struggle our way through the COVID-19 pandemic. Continue to be with Cassie Wolf, who, who may have recovered, hopefully, from this disease. Help us all to continue to take proper precautions and to recognize any special requirements that may be posted in places we frequent so we can help work together to slow the pace of this disease. Unfortunately, Lord, violence continues to dominate the headlines. We continue to hear stories about the conflict in Ukraine and we wish your help that we could put a stop to this. At the same time, help our leaders to continue to diffuse tensions between China and Taiwan. Closer to home, we still continue to see senseless violence. Help us to determine common sense solutions to our domestic disputes so that violence is not the first response. We ask your blessing on those entrusted to keep the peace, both home and abroad. Lord, several of your children are experiencing periods of pain or distress or have simply lost their way. We offer uh, special prayers today for George who has surgery upcoming. We continue to offer special prayers for Darlene Baker's nephew Dante who found out he has colon cancer along with Kenny Foster and Michelle, who are recovering from uh, surgery. We offer continued prayers for Jenny, Barbara, Linda, Eileen, Dennis, Lois, and Fatona. You have known these people since before they were born. You know their plights right now. We ask that you provide the guidance and healing that you know that they need. We also ask for a new healing and sympathetic hand for those names that we may not have spoken out loud today. Inspire us to reach out to those you call us to help. Lord God, we pray for this church and its ministry. Help us to maintain and grow this ministry that you've entrusted to us. Inspire us to find ways to connect all the members and friends to this body so that no one of them will ever feel disconnected or alone. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
now, my friends, let's be reminded of what Annie told us. Live life. Do the little things. Because when you do the little things, people realize that there must be something to this Christianity thing. It's not just a Sunday morning phenomenon. It's an everyday thing. And after all, we are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And we should be the ones to do that. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and every day to come. Amen.